Les habla Pocho Salcedo y damos la bienvenida a nuestra audiencia en lo, Latinoamérica y los Estados Unidos. Una vez más, explorando con ustedes el ADN de las noticias regionales e internacionales. Todos nosotros hemos sido beneficiados de alguna manera por hombres y mujeres que han tenido la valentía de denunciar en el sector privado público violaciones a la ley que afectan la salud, nuestra economía, seguridad o los derechos esenciales de los ciudadanos. Estos denunciantes de toda edad y trasfondo ponen en riesgo sus fuentes de trabajo, su propia seguridad y son objetos en muchos casos de acciones legales y presión de empleadores o gobiernos que comienzan sus ataques casi inmediatamente después de la denuncia y persisten a menudo por años. Hoy hablamos con Lewis Clark, el ejecutivo principal del proyecto de responsabilidad gubernamental, la organización líder mundial en la defensa de denunciantes. Esta organización presta apoyo a los delatores a nivel mundial desde 1977 un invitado fuera de serie para un tema fuera de serie. Mr. Luz Clark, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Luis Clark actualmente es director ejecutivo y CEO del Government Accountability Project, el proyecto de responsabilidad gubernamental desde 1978, habiendo servido primero como asesor legal, portavoz y embajador público de la organización. Antes de convertirse en abogado, Lewis era un ministro metodista y sus habilidades de asesoramiento pastoral y capacitación influyeron significativamente en sus elecciones profesionales. Recibió una maestría en divinidad de la Pacific School of Region y su licenciatura de la Universidad de Evansville. Lewis se reúne con delegaciones internacionales para describir la metodología del Government Accountability Project las leyes que se necesitan para proteger a los empleados que hablan sobre problemas y cómo usar la información para promover un cambio social progresivo. Well, we'll start right away and uh, we will be talking about whistleblowers. What is a whistleblower and what is the difference between uh, a leaker or a journalist? Uh, a whistleblower is a person who's working in, a, in an environment, so he's at, at the job, and he's essentially blowing the whistle on his employer. Uh, a leaker is someone who sort of sneaks the information out uh, to the public or, you know, outside the organization, but is not identified. And it's often not a, just about wrongdoing. It's it's there's other motives often involved uh, why is whistleblowing essential to democracy or is it not on um, july 30 1778 many years ago the founders of the united states unanimously passed an american first whistleblower protection law so it's been on the books from for this nation at least for hundreds of years Well, uh, the First Amendment, that's right, uh, is there. But if you're in a corporate environment, the First Amendment is, you know, doesn't pertain. It's that the First Amendment only works for public employees. So it's, it's a little bit limited. Plus, how our courts have interpreted uh, a person's rights under the First Amendment is, is not adequate. So we've had to go with passing individual statutes or laws uh, to uh, add protection to whistleblowers. And, and let me ask you, are motives important when uh, you're looking at a whistleblower? Reasons uh, to be a whistleblower probably range from uh, selfless altruism to a calculated maneuver to hurt people or organization. Is that an issue, the motives, or shouldn't be? Well, I, I think if, if we're talking about wrongdoing, uh, the motives probably is not as important because you just want to know about the wrongdoing. Uh, for example, if you're law enforcement, it's you, you want to know what's going wrong at the office, you know, what corruption might exist there. But if you're talking about an advocacy for whistleblowing, then certainly Uh, the motives of the whistleblower is quite important because uh, 
the certainly in our case, the American people uh, are going to identify uh, a lot more with a person whose motives is just public health and safety or anti-corruption. Uh, and they and these people want to do something about that corruption as opposed to someone that has some petty motive uh, of which uh, people will find a hard time identifying. Uh, you're one of uh, the iconic organizations that has been dealing with whistleblowers uh, for many, many years. Yes. And uh, there is always this um, focus on very uh, prominent cases like uh, the one that had to had a big impact on national security here in the U.S. Uh, for example, the case of Edward Snowden. Uh, which is still vehemently debated along the lines of whether they are he is a hero or he's a traitor. Yes. Um, and tell us a little bit about a little bit of detail as to how uh, you were engaged as an organization with it and what are your thoughts on uh, Mr. Snowden? Yeah, our focus, I mean, we did represent Edward Snowden, uh, not about helping him to reveal the information because he did that at one time very early on before we even knew who he was. Uh, but what we did is we tried to inform the American people about the value of what he had to say. And in other words, what our government was doing in particular to uh, the people who live here in this country in terms of surveillance, in terms of gathering data uh, about them, uh, without their consent and without their knowing even that it was happening. So it was important. Uh, his message was important. And so we did get very much behind uh, trying to carry his message forward and also trying to change the attitude uh, of the government and the American people about the value of what he had to say. And so we, we fought the idea that he was a traitor. And we don't believe he was a traitor. We think he was an absolute patriot. Uh, and that what he did uh, was to inform the American people uh, about what their government was doing to them. And what is the current status of uh, his legal status? Because uh, uh, the news that we have is that the government itself, the US government, still pretty strong about uh, uh, pursuing uh, legal action uh, against Mr. Snowden. They certainly are. Uh, and so therefore he's not uh, coming back uh, anytime soon. And he's uh, now uh, in Russia. There's always a discussion about expanding uh, whistleblower rights. You made some reference early on. And uh, in many cases, trying to avoid uh, that those rights are weakened. What is the general status right now in the United States and across the world? Well, we have 30 whistleblower laws now uh, in the, just in our national government. Uh, 23 of those are focused on corporations and about seven uh, for government employees. And essentially they're very broad. Uh, the protections that have been enacted are quite broad. And, uh, and they cover most activities uh, within the pr um, private sector as well as the public sector. If we're talking about uh, illegality, uh, tax evasion, uh, public health and safety dangers, uh, and in the case of the government, gross waste and gross mismanagement and abuse of authority. So, so the categories are beyond just illegality. It's really broader than that. And, uh, and these protections are uh, cons I mean, you know, we have now thousands of whistleblowers every year uh, who are taking advantage of the protection that these laws afford uh, to, to our people and our citizens and, and to people that live in this country. In addition to that, uh, bro more broadly, there, there is now a European directive uh, passed by the parliament with you not unanimous support, but very strong support. And now 28 countries of the European Union have to have whistleblower protection within two years. 
and, and that whistleblower protection has to be comprehensive. In terms of other countries throughout the world, there are 70 countries that have whistleblower protections, most of which I don't think are adequate. Uh, Peru has a law, and Chile has a law, although it only it, it's very limited. Uh, the, but other than that, uh, uh, Latin America does not have a whistleblower protection. Um, thank you. You were just mentioning Europe, and uh, one of uh, the whistleblower blowers blew open very successful the secret Swiss banking system that yeah. permitted U.S. citizens and citizens from all over the world uh, to cheat their governments um, um, billions of dollars. Yes. How, how did that work out? Well, uh, so far, it's worked out rather well. I mean, we were able to find out about a, a thousands of tax cheats in terms of this country. Uh, and there, I mean, there was a threat of possible prosecution, um, but so far, um, I think because the public has been supportive of the whistleblower, uh, they have not take, been able to take action against the whistleblower. But it's, um, there, there was actually a, a whistleblower about 20 years ago who actually, from Switzerland, also from the banking system, and the, the whistleblower there ended up having a political asylum within the United States. I, I think as we're talking internationally, uh, probably there is a lot of uh, cooperation among uh, whistleblowers uh, that are dealing with the trafficking of wildlife worldwide. Uh, yeah. Do you think that this crime could be effectively combated without whistleblowers? Oh, oh. Well, I, I, I almost think that any crime, whatever you're looking at, needs to have protections for whistleblowers because whistleblowers are what law enforcement depends on uh, in order to find out what's actually going on. And so if there was a way to provide protection for these people, many more people would come forward about problems. And, uh, and yeah, sometimes the pro sometimes they might be wrong, but at the same time, more often in our experience, they're right about what they're saying. We're going to go to a short break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking about how do the whistleblowers, what are the best practices, uh, right. how do they contact, uh, how they get protected and uh, what are those uh, good examples that you can tell us about. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. And we are back again uh, with uh, Mr. Lewis Clark, and uh, he has dedicated his professional life to the defense of um, and protection of whistleblowers all across the world. And we were asking him before the break, what were uh, those good practice, best practices uh, for whistleblowers? How do they initiate contact? Uh, how do they protect themselves? Um, what are those general recommendations, uh, Mr. Clark? Yes. I Probably the best thing that anyone can do is from the time that they see wrongdoing that they're concerned about is to keep a log about all their activity, you know, both in because 99% of whistleblowers bring the problem to their bosses first or their fellow employees before they become a, a really a whistleblower. And so therefore, usually they're, they're identified. So if they're going to take additional step, you know, in terms of whistleblowing, like contact law enforcement, con contact members of parliament or of Congress. And so if they're going to take that step, or talking to the news media, for example, uh, if they're going to take that step, then at that point, they need to take detailed 
chronology of everything that happens to them within the workplace, because that's going to be an important record uh, if they are challenging any kind of negative action that might be taken against them at the workplace. And another thing is to be sure that they're right about what they're saying. So they, you know, even though the law really allows someone to be wrong if they are acting in good faith, it's a, it's a, it's much more difficult to defend someone if they're wrong. So they really do need to be right about what they're saying. And very often that means using their expertise uh, to prove the point uh, that they're, you know, that what they're saying is right. So they just need to make sure that their documentation is in order uh, and their, their expertise is solid uh, and then uh, taking uh, detailed uh, notes about what happens to them once they uh, go public, public in any kind of way. It is a very long process and to start it right will just help everyone. Uh, presently, uh, we were talking about uh, and reading accounts of uh, uh, wrongdoings in a global scale, um, like in the World Bank, yes. uh, where uh, some whistleblowers uh, uncover certain activities. Likewise, uh, right at the border between the United States and Mexico, uh, there are also whistleblowers. Can you tell us a little bit about what are those uh, whistleblowers doing in those two instances. Yeah, the, uh, first of all, in the terms of the World Bank, Paul Wolfowitz is probably the most corrupt president that has ever been in charge of any kind of development bank. Uh, we had 40 whistleblowers that came to us about activities at the World Bank that were highly questionable and in some instances illegal. And, uh, and so, for example, uh, one person revealed to us the personnel records that indicated that his, uh, Paul Wolfowitz's girlfriend received an illegal $50,000 raise, and then I think the next year, uh, like a $30,000 raise, and that Paul Wolfowitz personally engineered that raise. And we had all the documentation about that. And even though our president of the United States at the time and our vice president were actively involved in trying to get him not to resign or be fired, we, we won that case. Uh, it took seven weeks uh, in, in terms of us raising all these concerns, um, but eventually he was forced to resign as a, because of this wrongdoing. Uh, in terms of our own borders right now, uh, the American people are finding out about what is going on in terms of the health health of the individuals who are being detained uh, and what's happening in terms of the of the abuse of children we have uh, health officials uh, doctors uh, as well as other uh, clinicians who are reporting to us about the unhealthy conditions and about the the abuse of solitary confinement and about the, for example, vaccines are being given to children that are adult level vaccines and they're being given to children just because of incompetence. Uh, and so we're reporting all this to the media uh, and it's made national, it's been brought to national attention. Uh, Congress is holding hearings on this. Uh, we'll see where it goes. But right now, uh, the information that they're telling us about what's happening with the, including the separation of families is startling uh, to the majority of people in this country. You dealt with many whistleblowers. Um, what is the psychological impact on them? And normally society uh, doesn't get on board right away. They, um, think about the motives, they think about uh, whether this is good or not, not good for uh, society or especially in issues of national security. That has to be taken a huge toll on the psychological well-being of the whistleblowers. Yeah, it, it, it's, it certainly does have a serious impact 
on, on people on the job who are going through the kind of stress that often occurs when they raise concerns. What we, what we advise people is that they should, they should tell their families what they're intending to do so that the support systems are going to be around those people. Uh, and, you know, their friends as well. I mean, but just to help get through what's going to, what they're going to be facing. Uh, we also, of course, warn some people that they just shouldn't do it uh, because we, we don't, our own personal opinion is that uh, we don't think that they are going to be able to get through that process uh, in a healthy way. Uh, other people, I mean, you know, most people can as long as they have that level of support. And uh, I would say that it, it's, a, I mean, it's, there's no question it's incredibly stressful. Uh, and one of the things that happens within the institution is, of course, these people are treated often now as pariahs and they don't know who they can trust. And so one of the things that we tell people is everyone's not your enemy at work. So even though people are no longer wanting to have lunch with you or no longer want to be seen with you, that doesn't mean that they're part of the management. It doesn't mean that they themselves are, you know, are going to be, you know, are, are on the other side. And so we tell people that because we don't want the whistleblower to be creating enemies uh, and thinking that everyone's an enemy. What happens is that if there's an opportunity for those people to under oath talk about what's going on, they will tell the truth. So their you know, the, their former friends at the office, they're under oath. They're not going to lie for the for the boss, and so they will eventually be okay. Um, but you know, it's it's a rough go uh, until until vindication happens. Mr. Clark, we. Uh, wish to thank you very much uh, for the uh, time. Uh, uh, a whole life you have dedicated to strengthen uh, the protection for whistleblowers, and you've been in every uh, major uh, fight uh, to defend those rights. And uh, we thank you and we thank your organization uh, for what you're doing, not only for uh, the United States, but wherever your services have been needed. Thank you for this opportunity to share with your audience. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have Mr. Bowen here from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Pocho. Mr. Bowen, after you made public the wrongdoings at Citigroup for 18 months, culminating in November of 2007, you found yourself engaged with powerful regulators, the SEC, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, and others. How important was to have a competent and trusted legal team on your side? Watcho, well, thank you for asking that. I cannot stress enough to anyone that is out there that is considering blowing the whistle on a situation. I cannot stress enough the absolute importance of seeking legal counsel. And this is before you ever even say anything. Um, and I can, I can tell you that from my own mistakes because I actually blew the whistle for 18 months uh, without legal counsel. I sent thousands of pages of e emails, warning, management. Uh, and the only time that I finally got legal counsel was when I finally went to the board of directors, directly to the board of directors after 18 months. And um, they stripped me of my responsibilities and told me not to come back. And that's when I sought legal counsel. And that's too late. Um, I had the legal counsel uh, that helped me some with the bank. Uh, they also helped me some with the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Um, I had another uh, legal counsel that helped me when I went to the SEC. And, and believe me, leaving the, um, leaving the company and going into the government is an entirely, two uh, entirely different dimension. 
Uh, the important thing that I learned from my first two attorneys um, is that the attorneys very quickly figure out which side of the bread the butter is on. And trust me, it is never the side of the whistleblower. Now, that's the private attorneys that I dealt with. The only reason that I survived today, and I'm able to be here today with you, Pacho, and, and talk to your audience and, and uh, try, to, uh, try to seek some changes to prevent another financial crisis, is because I was introduced to the Government Accountability Project. Uh, once they became my attorneys and I got to know them and they are just incredible people uh, beginning obviously with their with their executive director Lewis Clark um, they did not have a hidden agenda and that for one thing instilled in me a tremendous self-confidence that I had some people behind me covering my back giving me trusted advice that I could follow. And that again is the only reason that I have survived. Quite frankly, the uh, once you leave a corporate setting and go into the government side, it requires an entirely different skill set. Um, not that you don't need the basic legal advice, but you need someone, an organization like GAP, quite frankly, that understands the government. They understand the regulators. They understand congressmen and the, uh, the powers that be in the, in the regulatory environment. So um, I, please, if you are considering blowing the whistle, seek competent legal counsel that you can trust. That is my advice, Bocho. Everybody who was impacted and could be impacted uh, by uh, a new financial uh, crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pocho. My honor. La importancia del denunciante y de su protección es clara. Es un elemento esencial en el funcionamiento efectivo de una democracia y es una herramienta clave para la lucha contra la corrupción y el mal uso del poder, sea en el escenario privado o en el escenario público. La percepción de la sociedad y del sistema legal del denunciante debería ser de protección, ya que la gran mayoría de los, en la gran mayoría de los casos son hombres y mujeres que ponen gran riesgo para eh, afectar la vida de la sociedad para una vida mejor. Hasta una próxima oportunidad en que podamos explorar el ADN de las noticias.